Heavenly Father, we do give you thanks and praise for giving to us your word. Uh, we know that your word is uh, inerrant and infallible, and we know that it presents to us uh, your revealed will, not only for history, but for our own lives. So God, I pray that you help us to uh, hear Christ within every page and uh, every section, and that we may be transformed by the renewing of our minds. Lord, of course, we pray all of this in the name of Christ, who is the Word made flesh. Amen and amen. Well, this morning we're continuing in our series through the book of Genesis. Uh, we are halfway through uh, chapter 19, so I'm going to pick up with reading uh, starting at verse 12, and we're going to end at verse 22. I'm going to go ahead and read those, and then we'll begin our brief exposition. Then the two men said to Lot, Whom else have you here? A son-in-law and your sons and your daughters, and whoever you have in the city, bring them out of the place. For we are about to destroy this place because their outcry has become so great before the Lord that the Lord has sent us to destroy it. Lot went out and spoke to his sons-in-law who were to marry his daughters and said, Up, get out of this place, for the Lord will destroy the city. But he appeared to his sons-in-law to be jesting. When morning dawned, the angels urged Lot, saying, Up, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, or you'll be swept away in the punishment of the city. But he hesitated. So the men seized his hand and the hand of his wife and the hands of his two daughters, for the compassion of the Lord was upon him. And they brought him out and put him outside the city. When they brought them outside, one said, Escape for your life. Do not look behind you and do not stay anywhere in the valley. Escape to the mountains, or you will be swept away. But Lot said to them, Oh no, my lords, now behold, your servant has found favor in your sight, and you have magnified your loving kindness, which you have shown me by saving my life. But I cannot escape to the mountains, for the disaster will overtake me, and I will die. Now behold, this town is near enough to flee to, and it is small. Please let me escape there. Is it not small, that my life may be saved? He said to him, Behold, I grant you this request also, not to overthrow the town of which you have spoken. Hurry, escape there, for I cannot do anything until you arrive there. Therefore, the name of the town was called Zoar. Friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So like I said, we're just working through the book of Genesis, and we come here to chapter 19, as I mentioned last week when we started it. Part of, of going through the Bible verse by verse, chapter by chapter, forces us to come across the passages that make us feel uncomfortable, uh, make us uh, question, and, uh, and of course we have to deal with them. So we are here, chapter 19, starting at verse 12. We talked about these two men, just sort of bring you back up to speed, who's here, what's going on. So we have Lot. Of course, remember Lot is uh, uh, Abram or Abraham's uh, nephew, uh, Lot and his family. They reside in the uh, region of, of city of Sodom. We have two men who are mentioned here. Uh, we, we know from earlier that these men are angels. These are angelic messengers, angelic beings. beings excuse me. They uh, came with the angel of the Lord who was uh, communing with Abraham in chapter 18. And as I mentioned, I, I believe chapters 18 and chapters 19 are, are occurring concurrently in, uh, in time and history. Uh, it's a, of course, we're reading it, so it looks a little bit different, but I, I think they seem to be going on uh, hand in hand. Um, and so we have these two men. We have Lot and his family. Uh, they are in the, the city of Sodom. They've come down there. We've talked about uh, Sodom's sin. And so we hear that they are proclaiming judgment on this city. And I wanted to make sure we understand clearly what's going on here. Uh, if you remember, we talked about uh, what, it, what they experienced, these two men who were uh, these angelic beings who came down, the whole city, Moses tells us. It's not just a, a select few. It's not a handful of rioters. Uh, the, whole, uh, the whole town has, has rabbled itself up against these two men in order to do uh, unnatural things with them, to have uh, sexual relations with these men. And we talked about how this is a, a travesty, and I want to make sure we understand that the Bible has a, a very clear position on same-sex marriage and homosexuality. I want to make sure we know that this is a, a clear sin, a clear error that is presented here. God does not enjoy it. God does not like it. In fact, we see that Sodom is destroyed uh, because of this, uh, this sin. 
However, saying all that, I want to make sure we're careful not to limit Sodom's sin to just that one thing. I, I maybe didn't make it clear last Sunday, so I'm going to make it clear this Sunday. That is not Sodom's only sin. If you recall, I listed a bunch of uh, uh, cross-references, and of course, you can do that. You don't need me to do that. You can go online and go to blueletterbible.org or bible.com and just type in in the search bar one word. And for instance, you could type in the word Sodom, and it will show you every time that that word is used in the Bible. It's a very simple process that is open to all of us. And that's exactly what I did, and I presented cross-references. I'm going to read one again for you from Isaiah chapter 3, verse 9. So this is the Lord speaking through the prophet Isaiah. And God says, The expression of their faces bears witness against them, and they display their sin like Sodom. They do not even conceal it. Woe to them, for they have brought evil on themselves. So as we look through, and like I said, I gave you those cross-references. If you missed it, uh, that sermon's online. You can check it out. Uh, I go in more detail there. But it's clear that when God sees Sodom, he doesn't see one sin. Unlike some preachers who highlight homosexuality as this one uh, grievous sin that, uh, that Sodom is uh, portraying. No, it's, we can't limit it to that one. The whole city is in, as Isaiah says, uh, doing sin that is unconcealed. Um, Isaiah makes it clear that woe are those who call evil good and good evil. Uh, woe to those who do not, uh, uh, who do not uh, 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 flee from evil, but instead pursue doing wickedness and injustice. Um, and indeed, we see from other parts, again, the other prophets, uh, that uh, what is going on in Sodom is much bigger than one sin. We have a whole city, a whole community of people who are unrepentant in the way that they disregard the holiness of God. And of course, it exhibits itself in other forms. Like I said, these uh, relations that they want to do with these men also reveals itself in an unjust uh, uncare for the poor and for those who are in need. Uh, we see it uh, proclaimed by, again, uh, Peter, that these are folks who, who go and they approve of any type of wanton sinfulness. And my point in all of that and all of this is reminding us that what Sodom is, is a city in rebellion against God. A city that's in rebellion against God. And indeed, we know that's true of all sin. Every sin that we commit, every sin, doesn't matter if it's a big one or a small one. It doesn't matter if it's one that's in the news or the one that's hiding secretly in our closets. All sin is rebellion against God. And that's going to be the subject of today's message. So again, the outcry that comes from Sodom is so great that the Lord has determined to destroy it. And so Lot goes out, verse 14, and he begins to speak to his family. He, we first find out he's speaking to his sons-in-law who were to marry his daughters. Just sort of a way of saying uh, it's clear from the first century, uh, certainly not first century, from the biblical perspective, that engagement to be married is just as strong and binding as marriage itself. We know that that's not true today. That doesn't make it right. It just means that society has decided to go in a different direction. God clearly sees that engagement to be married is a binding contract. We know this in Matthew chapter 1, 19, our favorite Christmas time stories, uh, when Joseph gets the message that uh, Mary is pregnant uh, and the baby ain't his. Uh, chapter 1, verse 19, Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her, planned to send her away or divorce her secretly. So already we see that uh, it's clear that even though Joseph and Mary were not married, this engagement uh, is still a, a binding contract. Again, I don't have time to go into marriage. We'll probably talk about that another day. But again, we see a, a reference to it here in the scriptures. So he goes to his sons-in-law who were, uh, again, expected to be married. And he says to them, up, get out of this place for the Lord will destroy this city. So he's telling them exactly what the angels have told him. He's received this word from God and he is uh, going out and preaching it, proclaiming it to his sons-in-law. 
And, they, and Moses tells us that when he appeared to them or when he came to them, he appeared to his sons-in-law to be jesting. We see that the unrepentant person will mock the preacher who calls for repentance. Let me repeat that again. The unrepentant will mock the preacher who calls for repentance. Church, this is true today. My name has been sullied in this community by people who say I'm a doom and gloom preacher because I call you to repentance. I don't care. Because it's clear that the kingdom of God is at hand. We read it in our, you heard it as a call to worship. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the good news. If Jesus thought that we needed repentance 2,000 years ago, and if Lot thought that his sons-in-laws needed repentance 6,000 years ago, then you better believe that you and I need repentance today. So I don't care what people say about me. I don't care who mocks and who jests because I'm not here to please man. I'm here to serve God. And thanks be to God that Lot had that same mentality because Lot is urging his sons-in-law Come with me. Flee to the mountains. God is going to destroy this city. Turn from your sin and follow me. In fact, God, uh, Moses tells us that when morning dawned, the angels begin to urge Lot. I imagine in my mind that Lot, for throughout the whole evening, he's hours upon hours trying to persuade his sons-in-law. God is coming. Here's evidence. Here's these men. Look at what's going on. Look, I, I have a, my uh, uncle Abraham's out there. Look at what God has done. We don't know. Of course, this is all conjecture here. But he's not remaining silent, I can guarantee it. If it's a life and death situation, he's not going to just say, oh, God's going to destroy the city. Ha <laughs> ha, you're so funny, Lot, and leave it at that. No, if he loves his sons-in-law, as I think he does, he would press the point as much as he can. And that's what I do. Because I love you so much, I'm going to call you to repentance. That may sound like doom and gloom in your ears. I'm sorry. Clear that wax and listen to the Holy Spirit. Today is the day of repentance. It's a very clear, urgent situation because he is constantly, constantly trying to convince his sons-in-law, but eventually the angels say, Lot, we can't hold on much longer. Take your wife and your two daughters. Leave those sons-in-law. They are unrepentant in their sin. Leave them. Take your family, the one that God has put in charge under you. Here, again, we can talk about the family. We don't have time to talk about it. But here I could point you to Ephesians chapter 5. Here we have Lot being a good husband and a good father, caring and providing for his family. The angels that told him, go. Those sons-in-law of yours, they're not married yet. Pack your bags and get out of Dodge. Up, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, or you will be swept away and the punishment of the city. Of course, again, the preacher knows the urgency for repentance. Now is the day of repentance. But also the preacher knows that, as Christ says, we cannot throw our pearls before swine. At some point, we have to recognize that we have said all that we can say, that the gospel has been presented, the truth has been laid out before others. And at that point, we must say, I have done 
the best I can. Or as Paul says, I fought the good fight. These angels are urging Lot to do something similar. You've spent the whole evening trying to convince your sons-in-law, now is the time to go. But he hesitated. Lot is not a perfect person, just like you and just like me. Lot hesitates because this is his city. These are his sons-in-law, people that he loves, people that he knows personally. And yet he knows that their sin will bring condemnation upon them. I think he's grieved. I don't think he hesitates necessarily because he's attached to Sodom. He may be. We can talk about that later. But notice the situation is he's trying to convince his sons-in-law that God is coming, that judgment is about to fall, and you will die in your sins and trespasses if you do not repent. I think he's grieving, which is why he hesitates. And so these men, Moses tells us in verse 16, they have to seize Lot. He's so upset, so sad, so uh, uh, be bemoaned by the situation that they have to physically grab him and the hands of his wife and his daughters and literally drag them out of the city. And this is why. Verse 16, the middle of it. For the compassion of the Lord was upon him. And the hymn they're talking about there is Lot and his family. So God's compassion was upon Lot and his family. So in a sense, even though Lot is not perfect, what we see within this story is Lot then becomes a figure, if you will, of a, of a redeemer, of Christ. Isaiah chapter 63, verses 8 and 9, uses this word compassion in the Hebrew, compassion of the Lord, and says this. For he said, that is God, surely they are my people, sons who will not deal falsely. So he, that is God, became their savior. In all their affliction, he was afflicted, and the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and in his mercy, he redeemed them. And he lifted them and carried them all the days of old. Isaiah 63 is obviously pointing us to the Messiah, to the, the one who is promised to come. And of course, he's pointing us forward to Christ Jesus. Lot, in a way, points us forward to this person that Isaiah prophesies about. And so Lot is a type of redeemer. In the midst of this person of Lot, who again is there to, uh, hopefully he wants to save his sons-in-law, but if not, he at least will uh, save his wife and his daughters. At least that's his, his, his goal, I imagine. We see in the person of Lot, we see the compassion and the conviction of God. I, I've said this before and I'll say it again. I've had people come up to me, people in this congregation come up to me and say, you know, Pastor, I don't really like the God of the Old Testament because he always sounds so mean. And he's always, he's always hurting people and, and killing things and stuff like that. And yes, that's true. Those, those things happen. But when you focus on that, you miss the grace. Because yes, God could have and he did destroy the city of Sodom. And remember what he, you know, the, the deal he brokered with Abraham. Oh, but if there's 10, I'm not going to do it. So there are not 10 righteous in Sodom. So God, even with that deal that he made with Abraham, has every right to destroy the city, which he does. But even in the midst of that judgment, there's grace. Because Lot and his wife and his daughters are redeemed. So while it might not be 10 people enough to save Sodom, God will not destroy, in this case, four persons who are covered by the righteousness of their familial head, which is Lot. Again, Lot is a type of Christ. Just like we, you and me, are covered by the righteousness of our head, Christ, Lot 
and the righteousness that God uh, saw in him covers his wife and his daughters. And we're going to talk about that next week. When they had brought them outside, one of these angels says to them, escape for your life. Do not look back. Do not stay anywhere in the valley. Escape to the mountains or you will be swept away. The truth is laid before uh, uh, Lot that the, the end is near. The time is coming. Very soon will God destroy this city. And so we remember once again that he's not a perfect redeemer. Oh, my lords, no. I can't make it to the mountains. We don't know why. Maybe he's old. Maybe he's tired. Maybe he's still grieving in his heart. Maybe he knows that his wife and his kids can't go that fast. I don't know. Lot doesn't actually tell us. Moses doesn't reveal to it. All we know is that Lot is concerned that they're not going to make it to the mountains. And so he begins to broker a deal with the angels, just like Abraham. This town over here, he says in verse 20, it's, it's near enough to flee to. I, I know we can make it there. And it's very small. Let me escape there. Is it not small? It's not even on any map. Let, let us go there that my life may be saved. And so the angel says to him, yes. A uh, lot please bargains with this angel, very similar to Abraham. This insignificant village as compared to Sodom and Gomorrah. Let me run there. And just by way of mention, I'm only going to mention it very quickly. It's not necessarily an insignificant city. If you remember what we talked about before where Lot or where Abraham has this battle with these five kings and they're headed by this king named Shadalomer. Well, one of the other kings is the king of what would become this city of Zoar. Moses includes that in there. So it's not necessarily a righteous city. It's not any better than Sodom. It's just a lot smaller. Let me go there. And so the angel who has this ability relents, but only for a short time. Again, grace in the midst of judgment. If you point to an act of judgment in the Old Testament, I'll likewise point to an act of grace because it's there. It is there. Escape, for I cannot do anything until you arrive there. Three points of application and we'll close. One, we cannot escape our sins. We cannot escape our sins or their judgment without a mediator and a redeemer. You see how suddenly doom and gloom changes? If I left it off at the first part, we cannot escape our sins. Yeah, that is a lot of doom. That is very gloomy. But there's hope. The hope's not in you, and it's not in me, and it's not in this church, and it's not in any church. Well, any physical church, let me say it that way. The hope is in the head of the church. We cannot escape our sins or their judgment without the mediatorial, redemptive work of Christ on the cross. Lot was good as dead if Abraham had not mediated on his behalf. Lot would have been good as dead if the angels hadn't have dragged them out of that city. Lot needed a mediator. Two, God has provided no small salvation and no mean sanctuary. Lot couldn't save his sons-in-law. We saw that. And eventually we'll see that he can't even save his wife. We'll talk about that next week. Lot couldn't even save himself. He needed Abraham mediating and these angels pulling him to safety. God has provided no small salvation and no mean sanctuary. He has given to us his own son as a propitiation. That's James and that's Paul. God has given, excuse me, John and Paul. God has given us his own son as a propitiation. 
Jesus stands or sits in that seat of judgment, taking the wrath of God, just like Sodom, so that you and me and all others in him can stand before God justified. Grace and judgment displayed on the cross. My final point. Today is the day of salvation. Yesterday is gone. It's behind us. Your sins are back there. Tomorrow isn't promised. Tomorrow isn't guaranteed. Today is the day of salvation. If you sinned yesterday, today's the day to repent. If you sin today, today's the day to repent, not tomorrow. Because tomorrow is not guaranteed. Escape sin's grasp by clinging to Christ. Both our temporal sins and our eternal sins. We know that, that we, do, we stand justified before God by Christ. Romans 8, chapter 1 is still true. Therefore now there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Romans chapter 8, verse 39 is also true. Nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. So our eternal sins are covered by the righteous act of Christ. But that still does not mean we are free to sin. Though we are freed from sin, we know that every day sin affects us. And again, they may not be big sins. So that's again the problem when, when pastors focus on Sodom and focus on homosexuality as, as the sin. Because what happens is people, whether themselves or congregants, can look and say, well, that's not me. I'm not like that. But the problem is, is you do sin. And Paul gives us a whole list. We've talked about it all last year already. But we know that when we sin today, today is the day for repentance, not tomorrow. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for your grace and your judgment I know that seems weird. Perhaps it's strange in someone's ears to thank you for your judgment, but we know that you are a just and a holy God. We know that in your perfection, sin cannot exist. And so we know that your righteousness will stand victorious. But we also know that that's not good news for us. And so we look towards the good news, which is your grace which is your wrath poured out on Christ so that we can stand redeemed before you. God, I pray that for some reason, if there is none who has ever submitted to Christ, today is the day to come to him. And if there is any sin in our lives from yesterday or today, now is the day of repentance. God, I pray that your Holy Spirit convict us that we may turn to you and escape into the wonderful embrace of Christ our Savior. Amen.